Um, I did trace a couple of data um, issues this morning, and then there were a couple of challenges back, if not to me, to off jam. So while I'm going through my slides, I'll try and sort of touch upon those. And those challenges was were with respect to off jam's role in, in all of this and off jam's role in, in data availability in particular. So we did talk a lot about the Low Carbon Networks Fund today in various um, presentations, or others talked about the OCNF Fund. And I suspect the reason for making so much noise about it is uh, because it is potentially a world first. We haven't been able to find anything as big as this in terms of funding available. and. Uh, especially around uh, some of the rules we have um, with respect to um, intellectual property and how that is handled and data. So I'll talk about that a bit. But just for those that are not entirely familiar, the fund was established during the negotiation of the current price control, um, DPCR5. Uh, and uh, that negotiation happened at around 2008, 2009. And then the first uh, uh, sort of uh, competition um, in the second year of, of this project uh, was run in 2010. Um, the, the, we are talking about, uh, in fact, it's not 500 million pounds uh, when it relates to distribution, electricity distribution net networks, it's 600 million pounds um, split in, in four um, different components, one of which doesn't necessarily belong to the um, Low Carbon Networks Fund, which is the first row on this um, table, um, and that is the innovation funding um, incentive, and that has been there for ages. It, it provides, it distributes about 20 million across the DNOs for R&D projects, and this is where we get a lot of the small to medium enterprises um, uh, interested in, in um, providing some bright ideas, and also academia and um, some of the um, other sort of smaller participants, not that academia is a small participant, but um, uh, academia gets involved because it's very much around um, R&D. So that is about 20 million uh, pounds per annum, um, and that's sort of um, arm's length uh, when Ofgem is concerned. Then we have the first tier of, of uh, the OCNF, which is, again, distributes around 80 million pounds per annum uh, over the uh, five years, uh, and that is still relatively small project. Um, it just provides the ability of the uh, DNOs to pre better prepare for uh, the low carbon economy, but uh, actually quite often those projects lead into bigger projects, and these are the second tier projects where we run an annual competition, uh, 64 million uh, available in that competition. We don't necessarily need to award them. If we don't get a decent project, we can decide not to award any money, but so far we have uh, in, in the first three competitions. This year we are running the fourth competition for that, again, um, 64 million pounds available, uh, million pounds available for electricity distribution networks. And what's on not on this slide is that we, this year for the first time, we also have the so-called network innovation competition running, um, and that is a competition where our transmission companies, um, gas and electricity, um, and our gas distribution companies um, are able to compete for roughly um, between 40 and 50 million pounds. And we have the first set of submissions, both for the LCNF uh, EFO competition and the um, electricity transmission, gas transmission and gas distribution competitions. They arrived on the 19th of April. We're currently evaluating them. Uh, this is the first stage of the competition, the initial proposal stage. Um, very happy to say that we haven't published them yet. Um, not happy to say that. I'm just going to say that we have participation by everybody um, in, in the market, which is really good news, really good news. Um, so the, the, what's not on this slide, and this is where the, another 100 million pounds available, is as part of the LCNF, we have what we call the discretionary award for uh, project. We haven't started the warning that for projects in the LCNF that have been particularly 
well structured, well delivered, and have produced outstanding amounts of knowledge. So uh, we are structuring currently, we're thinking around the policy of how we structure that particular reward, uh, but this is uh, yet to come. So uh, demand side management, um, really, uh, the LCN uh, fund is already um, developing key learning with respect to uh, demand side management or demand side response. So this is some of the uh, LCNF trials that provide that learning. Um, it's, it's a number of those, and not all are listed, actually. But this is just to illustrate a point that when, when the fund started, people tended to talk a lot about the technological developments that might come across. They're speculating of what gadgets or what bits of software will, will be trialed. Uh, but in fact, quite a lot of our projects, so the projects that have already been approved, are very much around commercial arrangements and are very much around um, the engagement with the consumer and demand side response. So we have a list of those, um, the customer-led network revolution and all carbon. London, the first two uh, were awarded, the funding was awarded uh, in the first year of the competition, then their third year actually 40 of, um, 30 of operation, they started 2011. Um, so they have delivered some learning and they're very much um, around that engagement with the consumer and engagement with equipment, if you wish. Um, and they're trialing various things such as uh, GeoS price signals uh, mm, to domestic customers, um, but also uh, various um, sort of innovative um, End-use tariffs, time-of-use tariffs, um, restricted tariff tariffs, um, direct control uh, in some circumstances. Um, some of those are provided through suppliers. Um, the, the, the trial not only trials not only look at domestic customers; they also look at industry and commercial customers in this. And then we have Bristol that was mentioned today. I think um, this is very much uh, um, it's obviously based in Bristol, but um, testing variable tariffs to um, encourage um, use at uh, times of high uh, PV generation uh, involves also local storage. Um, then we have capacity uh, to customers that are trialing um, demand response contracts. Uh, this is very much to recover s the system from uh, faults or post fault um, recovery. Um, it also trials um, um, in parallel with that new connection um, offerings. Uh, manage contracts and uh, to reduce connection charges to, to customers. Falcon is another one, commercial arrangements to industrial commercial customers. Um, and then New Thames Valley uh, testing um, automatic um, uh, demand response. Innovation Square, that's one of the, the, the last year's project, the, the new ones, um, again, um, testing uh, widgets or, or equipment to um, automate control, uh, for automatic control of uh, electric vehicle charging. These are all provided for illustration just to, to demonstrate that the, the LCNF uh, project uh, is one focal point uh, of one of the key questions around smart grids, and this is how the consumer is going to engage with the idea of smart grids and demand side management I I more specifically. Um, actually, uh, these projects uh, are going to deliver some learning around the costs and benefits of, of some of the proposition around demand side response. It was, it's going to give us a bit more insight as to what uh, price signals, if any, are going to work from the distribution perspective. Um, as you can see, it also tests some more automated approach. Um, but, but the bottom line is this knowledge is going to actually crystallize or dispel some of the myths around consumer engagement and crystallize some of the issues and some of the tools and methods that should be applied to make sure the consumer not only engages but, but actually is able to understand and get some, some of the benefits. So it's, it's very valuable in, in that respect. Um, so, so far we have about 165 million in those second tier projects um, invested by customers directly. I mean, the whole fund is based on consumer money. Consumers are paying for it, in other words, uh, in addition to the normal price control um, um, sort of revenues they need to, to cover with the um, geo charges. Uh, so, so we are testing 
uh, DS SAS solutions as part of this. Uh, important point for some of you in the room, and you probably know that, that co our companies must engage with partners and collaborators as, as part of this. And now to some of the challenges in, in the middle box. It is an absolute requirement of the LCNF governance framework for the data that is generated, and, and there's lots and lots of data that's being generated through the trials. It is a requirement for that data to be made available to the rest of the GNOs. And, and in fact, um, to the extent that is um, not constrained by various privacy and other concerns to be disseminated more uh, widely. And it's done through various channels, some of which we actually regulate for, so the knowledge dissemination events, we haven't prescribed exactly how those will happen, but there are plenty of those looking at the calendars of various organizations, the um, IT, uh, conference rooms, um, smart grids, GB. You see they have almost weekly events, dissemination events now. There's an annual LCNF and conference. It's normally a very successful event this year. It is in November in Brighton. This is where all the DNOs tell us about their projects and people like Steve stand up at there and a very sort of uh, enthusiastically explain um, the learning of, of the various projects that the, the DNOs are running. Then we have something which is, uh, uh, I'm sure, of interest to some people, at least in the room. We have the, the, uh, a new concept, the, the Smile Grids ENA portal. We've prescribed uh, the existence of, of that in the network innovation competition. Um, it is already available on the DNA uh, website, and I encourage people to look at it. It will be formally launched on the 25th of June. But this is a place, a point, where all of the learning from the various LCNF, Tier 1, Tier 2, and IFI projects, gas and electricity, are, go are going to be found over time. And, and we, as stakeholders of that, would need to encourage uh, the DNOs and the NNA to, to uh, make that data available in a timely manner. Um, there are also uh, other uh, things that are prescribed in our governance framework. There are six monthly reports the DNOs must issue about their project. There are closed down reports uh, at the end of each project. And we have IP arrangements which um, make sure that uh, IP created or intellectual property uh, created by the consumer funds is available to the DNO so the consumers can benefit from it. And if there is a formal IPR created, the consumers also get the royalties generated from, from commercializing that IPR. So there's lots of data. There was a challenge on, of them to do something more about it. I'm sort of confident we've done a bit, but I do hear the challenge about, okay, the, the data is there, the portal provides some high level data, DNOs have a lot of data, have generated a lot of data in house, how does that get accessed? We've discussed that around working groups and we um, are talking about open door policies, data being av readily available so the rest of the DNOs and their contractors can go in and access that data. But th there was a challenge around how do we make sure, sure data is actually standardized, or the format of data is standardized, and I'll encourage, obviously, industry and everybody in the room to really make suggestions as how this is done best, because in, in this uh, century, that shouldn't be a big issue, uh, one would hope. And then we expect the DNOs to utilize all of this in their business plans. Um, DSM is likely to be um, useful to them in two ways. So the first time um, demand-side response is really useful to the DNA and customers is when a new connection is made. This is really um, uh, sort of quite uh, prominent in the in the connection of wind generation, for instance, or any distributed generation. I make a, an application for a connection in a constrained region. I'm told that connection may cost me tens of thousands of uh, pounds. The desire is to also have the DNA providing an alternative offer which involves demand um, uh, side response or smart grid solutions in, in general. I, it involves some non-firm arrangement, I, I involves automated network management um, technologies. So, so really we can connect wind generation much earlier than that generation would have been connected if they wait for the um, network to be reinforced and at much lower costs. I mean, there are obviously trade-offs there because they might not be dispatched 100%, but there are various LCNF projects that are actually looking into this issue right now. Um, now, one important um, aspect of, of demand-side response in the context of domestic customers is 
currently uh, there is absolutely no way in some circumstances uh, because of the lack of smart metering to understand which domestic customer has contributed for, for the need of network reinforcement. Therefore, it would be quite unusual for a not to be able to, to, to go um, and charge a particular domestic customer because they've exceeded their national connection agreement, uh, given they have only accumulation metering um, capability. Uh, in the future, when we have smart metering data, obviously that, that is likely to change. However, for the time being, we, um, in our strategy documents, uh, in, in the future price control strategy documents, we've said that we'll continue to socialize the cost of, of increased demand of domestic premises. That creates a challenge, obviously. It says, okay, my cost, if I um, install a jacuzzi or heat pump or electric vehicle and my demand is three times higher than my neighbor, ten times higher than my neighbor, I still pay exactly the same Jewish charge, then therefore I have no incentive to, in fact, reduce my consumption at peak. Uh, and that, that important, so that was illustrated a minute ago. So w we need to do some things uh, very quickly. We, we, and especially when we have the smart metering data, we need to ensure that we return the incentive, if you wish, so customers can properly engage with the smart grid concept and, and demand side response and, in fact, incentivize to manage their usage I I in an appropriate way. Um, so there are options around that, um, and they the vary from a pure price signal through Jewish charges to um, a more automated or more mandated approach. People talked this morning about frequency response capabilities in, in wide goods or, or other devices at our homes. The, the key questions here are, and we are yet to uh, get to the bottom of this issue, are customers going to respond to price signals, how strong those signals should be, for how long they'll, they're going to respond to those, is some automation necessary, would the customer prefer to have their demand side response uh, automated, and while the LCNF trials are going to inform us around some aspects, I think some policy work could still need to be done around that. And in the last couple of slides, I'll very quickly mention what we are doing around that. Last year we had, um, and we have this smart um, grids forum operating, it's been operating since 2011, some of you probably know about it, it's a forum of experts, meets on a quarterly basis, but it has lots of work streams, and one of those work streams um, was created last year to examine any commercial and regulatory uh, barriers to the deployment uh, of smart grids, especially demand side response during the next price control period, which is 2015 to 2023. The conclusion is, on the face of it, there aren't any direct barriers for DNOs to, to um, apply demand side response. In fact, they are already using it, and somebody uh, actually, I think Roger said that this morning. Um, there are some technical specifications that would need to be changed, and um, engineering rec recommendation P26, a design standard in a way, needs to be changed to allow DSR to be counted, counted when uh, DNOs um, plan their network. Uh, some of the connection charging rules may need to be changed, uh, but clearly there are no immediate barriers for, for direct engagement. However, mm, the group that uh, works in six also uh, identified the need to look at this from a much broader perspective, not only from a DNO's perspective, and the need to um, look at the barriers and commercial enablers for DSR from, from a much wider point of view. So this is the last slide you'll be happy to know. So this work stream six is now embarking on another body of work which says, let's look at what are the options for customers engaging with smart grids and with the DSM in particular, and le let's look not only at what are these options, ranging from price signals to, as I mentioned, uh, automated response or, or um, uh, the, the involvement of, of specific technologies, but let's look at what are the roles and relationships of all of the rest of the parties in the market around that. What is DNO doing versus a supplier or an aggregator? What is National Grid's role with respect to that, that particular customer response? And then let's have a look at what are the um, various commercial and regulatory arrangements that we need to have in place under each option to effectively discharge those roles. Uh, so we will have an output uh, after this. Is one, one, um, it will take a bit of time. Uh, and as part of this, we'll have to actually look deeply into the role of DNO as a, not only a, an owner and operator of the network assets, but really as a, an 
we can we refer often to a DSRO or distribution system operator as a body that actually actively participates in this market and actually has a specific role to keep um, the lights on with smart grid um, technologies, including uh, demand participation. So that was what I was going to say. <laughs>